Rashi Agarwal Favier is a content creator, a former model, a stand-up comedian, and an activist. She moved from India four and a half years ago to Amsterdam, right before the pandemic, where in her words, she became a person of color overnight. She talks about this as well as jokes about white privilege, colonization, feminism, and life in the Dutch capital on TikTok and Instagram. She credits her approach of making people laugh while also learning something as part of the reason her content has gone viral on TikTok and Instagram. Rashi has an inherent drive to follow her own evolution and use her own privilege to educate and inform. She insists on remaining authentic on her accounts by following whatever is interesting to her in the moment. Thank you so much for joining me today, Rashi. I'm really excited for our conversation. Hi, I'm really excited to be here as well. When I um, first encountered you on, on Instagram, I immediately recognized a lot of what you were saying, but also learned a lot of things. Um, and so I'm really, really happy that you agreed to come on. Um, I'm one of your I'm one of your fans. <laughs> it's my pleasure. <laughs> so I want to I want to start out because I think when I when we spoke earlier, I really was struck by this notion of your coming to the Netherlands, bringing new awareness to your own privilege and your own place in the world. So can you speak, tell us that story, if you would? Yes, I think um, in India, privilege plays a really big part in how you grow up there. And I have a lot of privileges in India. I have caste privilege, class privilege, also my skin tone. There's so many things that are, you know, going for me there. And I was always aware of that. Um, and I always tried to use my privilege for, you know, bringing awareness and doing something good. And I think moving to the Netherlands um, suddenly shows you the real class divide also in a, in a country where you move to. So um, I feel like you uh, you just hear things or things happen to you or the way people treat you is so different based on how much privilege you have, which I think is so unfair. And when I moved to the Netherlands, I saw that kind of immediately because suddenly you are a person of color where in India I was just a person. Um, so I saw a lot of things that I never had to deal with that I, you know, when I landed in Netherlands, I suddenly was faced with them. Um, not to say I didn't still have tons of privilege here as well, um, but it's just something that, you know, you have to kind of face in your, like I moved here when I was 31. So it's something you just have to like be aware of suddenly, which I found sort of interesting and, that sort of made me want to talk about it because I was sure other people were figuring this out as well. Um, so also then taking that privilege and then using it to talk about it because I could talk about it and I had a voice. Um, yeah. Would you say, would you, were you shocked? Were you, was it completely unexpected, would you say, this um, this new awareness or these realizations? Were you would you describe it as shock or would you describe it as something No, I don't else? think I was shocked. I'm pretty aware of how, yeah, if you're not white, how you're treated um, in the world. I've seen it firsthand also if when I've been around white people in India, you can see instantly how they're treated, you know, better. Um, so I wasn't shocked. I think it was just like, it was a feeling that I hadn't experienced before, like the, the first time I faced racism in the in Amsterdam. Um, it was just a bodily feeling that I've never felt before. So it was just very different and something I wanted to explore, like where, how does this feeling manifest and how, what is making me feel? Because in India, I am the oppressor. So I also wanted to learn about it, this, this feeling from different points of views and ways. Um, so yeah, it was more, um, just interesting development. yeah that's really yeah. it's really beautiful the way you say it that you you went from feeling or being the oppressor in one case to being something the oppressed in another or the lesser so you would describe it in when you lived in India growing up there that you saw people being more privileged but you never felt like you were oppressed 
Um, I, I think in that, India, the only thing that? where I feel oppressed is because I'm a woman um, and India is a very patriarchal society. So definitely that's why I also talk about feminism a lot in my content, because that's the one way I really felt that, you know, it's unfair in my um, sort of experience but I was also really aware of how much privilege I have based on cost and class and all of these other things um so that's the difference I think but definitely that also brings across here here also here it's not an equal society if you think of genders and the sexes so here is just an added layer I think and it's yeah it's very interesting how different societies decide how much you know privilege you get based on just some, something that you can't decide uh, or choose for yourself so yeah. yeah and would you mind I have my own interpretation of this because I also came from a very patriarchal place but I would love to hear how you experience that where you're from which can we tell people from which part of I'm, India I'm are you South did India, you but I'm North Indian but I grew up in South India okay and what is that like if I know nothing because I'm I don't explain what that means. Like what are the people like where you're from or? Well, I I grew up. What I I always say I'm from a small town of three million people, which, uh, yeah, it's it's funny, but it is it's true. It's it's a smaller town. So it's a bit more chill, more relaxed. Um, but the inequality of the sexes is very inherent in the society so it's not really geographically doesn't matter where you are it's just how the culture is um, and how Mm -hmm. you know you're treated differently just because you're a woman and I think the biggest thing is uh, the safety for women so it's not safe to be outside as a child if you're a girl if it's not safe to walk you know out by yourself at night even Sometimes even the, during the day, there's a lot of cat calling. There's a lot of sort of staring. It depends on what you're wearing a lot. Like if you are wearing something that is not acceptable, you can get blamed for something that happens to you. So it's a lot of victim blaming. Um, I have to say my family is amazing. So I was not raised sort of unequal to like my brother. So it was in my family. It was a very nice environment, but you know, their relatives and their um, people who want to always comment on things. And also women are supposed to do certain things. And if you deviate from that, you're sort of like a bad woman or uh, you can't be outspoken. You have to sort of just lay low and do the things that society has deemed for you. Like, And I think the biggest thing for me was marriage because marriage is such a big part of Indian culture and it's something you just have to do and this is not just for women this is also for men so I think marriage was the biggest thing that was sort of I was yeah I didn't feel like I wanted to do exactly what people were telling me to do or like I wasn't super for arranged marriage it works for a lot of people it just it was not for me but I felt like yeah as a woman you really have to navigate that because you have to make a lot of sacrifices if you, you know, get married and yeah, do certain things that society just wants you to do. And if you just want something different, you're you're not allowed. So that's sort of yeah, the dynamic. Yeah, that makes sense. I want to ask. Um, I want to back up, but then I want to go more into this. But what in your where you grew up or in India in general either is fine what is that divide based on in in where I'm from it's like based on religion religion kind of backs up this servitude of women and um and all this stuff but is it the same is it just what would you say it's based on what what gives that notion that women should be less than men or treated differently I'm- I'm not a history expert, but I think this is what I have read or sort of this is my information. Um, Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, But this is, I think this is comes from just the perfection of a patriarchal society. And I know that a lot of it was colonial. So the British brought a lot of their Christian values when they colonized India. Mm -hmm. So like the dowry system or women being property, and if you look mm. before um, the colonization from Britain, which was 300, 200, 300 years, 
uh, women were much freer, you know, you, women would roam around like topless with just like a thing. So if you see our ancient scriptures, you know, there's so much sort of nudity. There's also like, there's a lot of sex, like freedom of sex, like sexual, you know, like Kama Sutra comes from India. So I know a lot of it comes from colonization, but I'm, I don't know if it's, that's what all of it is, but to me it's like see it's just how it has been perfected to become like a patriarchal society wow you've just taught me something new well, i also when i learned <laughs> that i was shocked but but yeah. I, I definitely i in my knowledge of all so many things just doesn't and i have to keep reading because yeah I, when you are also the oppressor you are not super knowledgeable on a lot of things i've also started reading up a lot about anti anti-caste things i've followed a lot of accounts i want to learn more about casteism because it is so well and alive in india right now and people sort of deflect it by saying oh it's it used to be a thing of the past which is just so not true so yeah uh-huh. Can you explain that just a little bit? I think I know what it is, but would you mind just telling us briefly an overview of what a caste system is? So a caste system is where uh, the people are divided into four categories and the lower category is the lower caste and they include uh, certain uh, sections. Uh, so Adivasi, Bhaujan, Dalit, and they are just not afforded um, the rights as the rest of the three caste divisions would have. They get jobs that are not um yeah like considered dirty or lower for people to do so the, yeah. this, just so i know this is based on lineage then yes is it based on yes. lineage? I mean, again, so I'm who your father on this no 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 you're not but you're helping me yeah, understand so. so it's not based on like how much money you have it's based on who who your I think it, ancestors it, it, might it be. also is based on how much money you have because historically upper caste brahmin like caste have hoarded a lot of land and money so it does sort of have an effect on who then gets to have money now based on lineage of course so so it's all super interconnected and yeah yeah got it okay I know you told me you're not the expert but you're the expert to me right now so thank you for answering my questions um okay so you didn't know why you were being treated differently as a woman when you went outside of your house you just it's just part of your culture like that's the water you were swimming in yeah and I think because of the difference in my home and outside I just I think I questioned it more maybe because my home was different than other people and I also saw my friends they were treated differently than from their parents so like it was just a bit like I was questioning a lot I was questioning a lot of things like why does why do they get to go out and I don't just because I'm a woman? And why do I not get to wear this? Like, I was just questioning a lot, which also you're not supposed to do. No questioning. Yeah. <laughs> um, so is that just a thing in the culture or you are you just knew inherently you weren't supposed to question? I think you're when, when people tell you don't question anything, you just kind of... Uh, yeah, it's just out and open, yeah. just like a fact. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, I... I'm wondering because it sounds a lot like high high demand religions um, where they say don't question. And so when I see that in like a more, um, when I hear you saying that in a more like not religious um, context, it makes me very curious. So I, I, I want to dive in, but um, okay. So you were always questioning. It sounds like you were well, for whatever reason, um, you always felt a little different or like you were always kind of wondering and questioning when you weren't supposed to. And so do you think that was what made you always think you wanted to live abroad or tell us that story about eventually, eventually studying abroad? I think it stems from what I said about like just wanting different things and it's either, yeah, you don't have examples of that around you or um, you don't think you can have different things because that's just not the norm and this is before social media internet so your worldview was very much what was around you or movies or tv and not really other people living in other countries you didn't have a worldview because you you didn't have a way to see anything because the internet was not a thing so I think when I was teenager I just like I don't know I just wanted different things and I I, I think I was influenced by a lot of American TV 
uh, sitcoms. I just wanted like, you know, like a free life. I just, I feel like I didn't want to just do the thing where you study, get married, have kids, you know, and a lot of women don't work and that's changing now. But when I was growing up, like a lot of women didn't work and there was a set role for people and I just wanted different things. I just didn't know what, but I knew I didn't want that. I knew what I didn't want. So I think moving abroad was not, was me just wanting a bit more freedom to choose what I wanted. Um, and it could have been possible in India, but it's just something that I felt like would be easier, I guess, abroad. And I also wanted to travel. I think I also loved, wanted. To, I think I wanted to explore more cultures because I saw this on you know, TV or movies. And I thought it was so interesting that there are people who can be so different, but also they're humans. And yeah, just to meet different kinds of people, which again, if I lived in a bigger city in India, I would not maybe think how I thought, but I lived in a smaller town where we didn't have a lot to do or, you know, we had the same people around as like a small town sort of thing. So I think um, if I didn't grow up there, I might be different. Like if I grew up in Mumbai or Delhi or something, but yeah, that's what sort of, was yeah, like I just is... didn't want that. I wanted something else and I didn't know how else to get it, I guess. I highly know what you're talking about. I don't know what I wanted, but I knew what I didn't want that <laughs> I could have, I, I can, I think me and a lot of people listening to this can, yeah. can uh, relate. Um, so that led you to studying in London. Is that right? Yes. So I wanted to do something creative. I know like for my studies, I studied fine arts and then I really wanted to do fashion and I really wanted to study abroad because it just looked like so much fun. And I think in like I went to London in 2010 and around then social media was a th like a little bit of a thing. Internet was a thing. So I also saw a lot of people doing it that you could you know study abroad. And I got into London College of Fashion, which was a big like moment because I didn't think I would and then my parents let me go um and it was amazing I think it was my first and like um what do you say view of the world outside of my little sort of world that I saw and I to be honest I loved it <laughs> I was 21 it was amazing so I think that's where the yeah. insect bit me for like you know, exploring different things. And yeah. The insect bit me. I love that. You got the, you got the bug. Yeah, we always say you got like the say. bug. I yeah, no, I love Hindi, but... no, I like the way you said it. Actually, I'm going to start saying that. That's amazing. Um, and so you studied in Europe and felt, felt like you wanted to remain abroad. Um, and so tell us about I really want to know because you were in London and that's, was it more international? Why do you think when you came to the Netherlands, it was that you felt, I love this phrase that you use because it, I, I can relate in a different way, but you just suddenly became a person of color overnight. I love that you said that. I love that you're living that, but why do you think, can you tell us about that moment? Because you, you were obviously younger and all these things. So a lot comes with, age and experience but and also social movements yeah. going on I think the biggest Tell us difference that story. was that I was a student I think student life is mm. so different than actually living somewhere because you don't have to deal with a lot of things and I think England and London just in general has a lot of Indians so you don't really you're mm -hmm. like you're like a part of the crowd I feel like and again it was okay. I was young and maybe I did face racism back then but I just didn't know it was that I think I was just also a bit more aware of why people treat you a certain way I think I was very naive back then um mm. and yeah I th also I only had a visa for two years in London so I knew I was going to go back it's not like I could stay there so I, st I, right. I knew I had to study and leave again so I didn't so you do experience a place when you're when it's temporary you may experience it differently that makes a lot of sense yeah. too yeah interesting so when you came to the Netherlands, it felt like you wanted to make it a little more permanent. So that's one way. So can you describe like that moment or if there was a moment where you're just like, oh, wow, this is something completely different. I 
I would love to hear that story if you have. In Netherlands, you mean? Yeah, in the Netherlands. I mean, that moment, it's, again, so powerful to me that you say, overnight, I became a person of color. Like, that's an amazing notion. I so, think um, really, what's that story? Um, yeah, I think it was the job search sort of uh, mm. experience because I had to immediately, I even started looking before I moved. And then when I moved, I was still looking for jobs. And um, I knew a lot of Dutch people uh, when I moved here. And then they would tell me like, you should probably put there in block letters that you have a visa to work here because just because you have an, an Indian name, they will probably throw away your resume. And like a multiple people told that to me. It's not like one person, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then just the fact that you're Indian on a resume, they would just not pay attention to it or 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 the other side, which is like, oh, you're brown. So you might actually get in on diversity coda or something like you hear all of these things which i've never heard about before so i think that was when wow. i was like oh so this actually matters and then for sure the first time i fa faced like blatant racism in the pipe which is like the most like international area of amsterdam and i really that that whole experience just changed my sort of like wow you will actually discriminate against me just because of who i look like you know tell us that do you mind telling us that story about being in the pipe and that well um i've yeah i've also made a tiktok about it but it's um there was i was in a pop up shop i was like working uh in a, like a, with a brand and we were doing like a pop up shop and this woman, this older Dutch woman came in to try on clothes and th there were three of us in the store. None of us were Dutch. So it was not because I was not Dutch. Um, the other two people were white, um, French and Danish, and I was Indian. And she would just not talk to me. She was just not talk to me. I, w I would ask her a question. She would just ignore me and wait for those people to come out. And um, like, I, I, I thought I did something because that's immediately what you do. You you go inward and see what you did and and somehow you represent 1.3 billion indians because if you do something you're ruining the names of indians but white people never have that responsibility if one white person does something doesn't mean the entire you know uh, culture gets uh, a black mark but i thought i was doing something wrong so i started complimenting her like oh that color looks really good on you because i know white people love that compliment but uh and then she just was like not talking and then she was smiling and I smiled back and she's like no 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 I'm not smiling at you I'm smiling at her and it was not because I didn't speak Dutch because the other two didn't it was not because I was not Dutch because the other people were not because I know that's like you know you get annoyed that people don't speak Dutch in your country I get that but yeah so that was just like and I felt it like visceral in my body like I felt it it wasn't something I I felt she was she doesn't want to engage with me because <laughs> what I because there's nothing else. And I still doubted myself, but I couldn't doubt the feeling I was feeling. That was a very like like my hands were shaking. I was feeling shame. It was so many different things. And then I told some people what happened and they were like, Rashi, that's racism. Like they had to, the white people had to tell me like that that woman was, you know, and and yeah. also then some people told me like this is common because in in the netherlands it's a bit under the radar mm -hmm. and this was before i made content and everything because now i have a lot of hate racist comments but you know and you kind of see the reality a little bit but back then i just i knew this mm -hmm. existed but when it happens to you 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 do get like wow is this what it feels like so yeah, it's it's a lot different, I'm sure, to yeah. experience it than just to hear about it. And the disbelief in your own experience, I mean, it's all part yeah. of it. It was like these it. stages I went through in like 10 minutes. And then, yeah, one of the other ladies were like, oh, my God, she was so nice. I was like, no, she was not nice because <laughs> you could see how she was treating us differently just in the same room. Yeah, but I think yeah. the person of color thing really comes from the job search experience. Also, just when random people would yell at me i would like i would make a tiktok about it like what did i do is this like because it's when you i think it's also when you are in a new culture you question everything because you might be doing something yeah. wrong that is culturally wrong yeah. and i don't want to do yeah. that 
but then sometimes people are just dicks so yeah just being terrible yeah yeah I can relate to that as a white person just like constantly feeling like you're doing something wrong adding anything else on top of that would be a lot of stress yeah that Um, feeling and still like somewhat lingers like am I doing something of course yeah of course of course thank you so much for sharing that because I think it's um yeah, I think it's important to tell that and and not TikTok is important, but thank you for telling it here because I think it's an important moment. Okay, so you were here for a bit, but during the pandemic, you've kind of found your way on social media by following kind of your interests. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us how you got started in that. It was yeah, I was super bored. I was super unemployed. <laughs> It was COVID, you couldn't go anywhere. And I think this was like the thick of like the thick of lockdown where I think we even had like a night curfew and things like that. And I didn't have any friends. I didn't have like people to talk to. I couldn't go home for a while. So I just feel like I was looking for some sort of connection to people. And internet was the only way you could connect to people or your friends or your family. And I, yeah, I was on TikTok a lot and I was also on Instagram. I would do a lot of my personal stuff. And and one of my friends actually back in India, she told me, you should do this because I was making all these funny videos because it was just fun because Reels was just introduced on Instagram back then. And I was just making these funny things like transitions and I was doing fashion things because I loved like showing up my outfit and you know, also for the pop-up shop I was working at. So I was doing all of these things and my friend was like, you could actually do this. Like, why don't you, you know, do this more often and it could be a thing. And I was like, yeah, no, it's not me. I'm not going to do it. But I thought like making a little bit more funny videos was fun because I laughed at so many TikToks and then I made a TikTok and I laughed at my own TikTok for 15 minutes. So I was like, if I if it's funny to me, it must be funny to other people. And that's the TikTok that went viral. That was my first TikTok I ever posted. Um, and I think... And tell, tell us what it was about. It was tell it just briefly. Being really fast on their bikes. And it was just a really funny sound. And I took videos of Dutch people on bikes and I made it two times faster, like the video. <laughs> <laughs> the, the sound nice. is like, woo! And it's so stupid, but it's so funny. <laughs> And true. <laughs> so um, I think because my first TikTok went viral, you just want to make more because it is so much, you get such a dopamine hit with people laughing mm-hmm. at your at your joke. Uh, and then I yeah. made completely something else on Instagram the same day. It was about how if you're Indian, you pick something from the back of the shelf and not the front of the shelf. Oh yeah, the toilet or uh, the toothpaste. Anything. You're like I think of toothpaste, that one. Yeah. deodorant, any toiletry, I, even chips. I will pick the back because the front might be crushed, whatever. And that's the oh, that's uh, the thing. So like that's the thing. It'll be fresher. So you pick the back one. at the back. So I made ah, that video okay. completely different on the same day. Even that went viral, and I was like, "What is happening?" And then, yeah, I also made something about being tall and how. It was the joke was in India, they don't say, oh, my God, you're so tall. How nice. In India, they say, how are we going to find a boy for you? Because that was my life. Because I'm 185 centimeters, six feet one. And my entire teenage life has been like, how are we going to find a boy for her? How are we going to find a boy for her? So um, I think as soon as I like my TikTok started going viral and my Instagram also the same day, I think it gave me like, oh, my God, I could do this. And it was so much fun. Because I had so much time on my hands. Um, Mm -hmm. And the more and more I did it, the more and more I started getting comments and messages. And I finally, like, found people who I could talk to. And a lot of really cool, smart people follow me. Because the conversations I have in my DMs are just next level. And I also just feel like I have this, like, community online. uh, And they're some of the most amazing people. So... I felt like I was not lonely anymore. And even if I was, I would put it up on TikTok. Hey, have nothing to do today, but like, I'm going to try and go out. So like, I also 
we just post a lot of authentic feelings because I think a lot of people were feeling that during COVID, um, especially yeah. internationals if you just moved here. Uh, yeah, I remember the day you couldn't fly fly yeah. back to your parents. When I mean, that was a universally, yeah. no one ever thought that exactly. would happen. So yeah. if you're feeling that, you, you need to hear that from other yeah. people. It, it brought a lot of people together. Um, but so you were feeling that and felt you shared it and that what, do you find that you made a lot of people so was it a lot of people that you were connecting with with connections to the Netherlands or just everywhere in the world I think a lot of people who moved to the Netherlands um, but also people mm. from India who followed me back then because a lot of my Indian content was going viral then so I think it doesn't oh, nice. because the topic wasn't moving abroad then it was just how are we feeling? And, and then yeah. I added the layer of the feminist content. And so sort of, yeah. And that follows your personal journey Definitely. a little bit. I think what you're doing is really beautiful because you're following your own personal journey and bringing us along with you, which I think is a little bit how social media may have started yeah. out, but it's definitely gone away from that. So I am craving that type of connection still on social yeah. media. Um, and so I, I think that's lovely that you've, so you've kind of added these layers, like you said, of like feminism, white privilege awareness, you know, yeah. all these things. And so that, how does that changed for you? Um, how has that changed your audience or changed how you show up online or has it? Because those are big topics. Those are big, big, heavy topics for I some people. I think my main goal was that I never thought I would have an audience. I never thought I would have people watching me, listening to me. Um, I, I feel like I secretly always wanted it because I love attention and I love to talk, but I that was never the purpose. So once it started happening, I was like, okay, now I have all these eyeballs. Now they have to listen to what I have to say. So it's 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 a lot about what I have to say or what my experiences are because otherwise I feel like it's a bit fake. And I still plan yeah. content. I still like make connections. So, okay, maybe this would work now, but like, it's always what I'm going through and what I am sort of thinking about. Like I recently posted about going to the saunas here because you have to be completely naked. And this was yeah. my second time, but it was like a proper big sauna. I was like, I still, it can't get over the conditioning that we have where we feel so uncomfortable with yeah. The nudity and I just posted about it and I got so many messages you know talking about even from men that how we are so conditioned to be ashamed of our bodies and nudity and like so it's just this started like a conversation um and I love sharing things that I go through because I know other people relate to it and I think we just need yeah. someone to tell us we're not crazy because we're all going through the same experience we're all going through something yeah. yeah and experiencing the cult the culture outside your own culture is really it's it's ripe with um ideas exactly. and change and evolution yeah. like you said and so was there a moment i mean because when you're going viral there's sometimes i think if i were to think and i've watched other people there's this like drive to just do what the people want and get more and go viral again and again how was there was there a distinct decision when you made the decision or is there a reason you made the decision to not kind of follow that, follow that instead of your own path? I think a, because this is not my job. So I have a full-time job. So social media is not my job, like my personal Instagram and TikTok, which makes it easier for me to just do what I want to do and not care about the numbers, the followers, the engagement. I care, but not like it doesn't, you know, sustain my livelihood. I think there's two very different things. If that's your job, there's a different connotation to all of this. And the second thing I think is social media is such a pain in the ass to do if you don't enjoy it. If you don't enjoy doing, <laughs> making the content, it is in, insanely annoying. It takes so much time and effort and energy and you have to wait till it's sunny. And like, there's so many things. So I feel like if yeah. I don't enjoy it, I'm going to just stop doing it. And that I don't want that. Mm -hmm. So I just have to do what I actually like doing. And if I don't like it, it's going to annoy me. And then I will just not post anything for like a few days. So 
Yeah. yeah. I think it's just so bit that makes sense. I just want to, I want to have fun. And I'm very lucky oh, you're using not my like livelihood. So I can just do whatever I want. Yeah. But I love that because I think that, um, that's what made social media so powerful in the beginning. And especially for people who maybe have a need for a platform, but not the resources necessarily. Like you said, not everyone can be a full-time influencer. Um, and this goes for women, which I think women are often, they don't have as much yeah. time as men. Um, and of course, women are some of the best influencers. We get that. But like, I think women that need to tell their stories actually often don't have time or the resources and I, I resources, I mean, yeah. my time. Um, yeah. And so I really love that. I feel like you're being a, a renegade in this way, which I really enjoy. Um, and I think that that will. Um, yeah, I, I just love that you're able to be free. And that makes me happy. I want to talk about your expansion into stand up comedy. Tell us how that tell us that story and how it's going. I think uh, my friends have a lot of role to a very important role to play in that because um because i make funny content on tiktok and instagram people a lot of my friends would tell me you should do stand-up because you know you do comedy and to me that's just insane i was like i can't do comedy i can't like reels are different like you hop on a trend or you you can refilm a video like 10 times but like stand-up comedy where you have to make people laugh that is insane so a lot of people would tell me that, but I would always be like, that's not for me. And then I made friends in the comedy scene in Amsterdam. So um, because some of the comedians who are really amazing, they also do TikToks. So I met them through TikTok and then I met some comedians. And then I suddenly like thought about if I wanted to do stand up, what would I talk about? And then I took and I was like, wow, I have so much comedy content already existing which was my reels and tiktoks so i took one tiktok and sort of expanded that into like a basically i just pretended if i was talking about this topic to my friends and i wrote it down and then i posted on my and i, I posted it on my stories that everything is so crazy in my life right now that i just sat down and wrote my first stand up comedy bit and then so many messages like oh my god I would so come to your comedy thing and I think that's the thing with having an audience on Instagram you can get instant feedback on something that you're thinking about and then one of the comedians um Ram go watch his comedy it's local tourist comedy he messaged me like hey if you want a five minute spot I'm in, a, in my next show I was like are you insane I can't do this he's like you can do it it's gonna be great and again <laughs> me loving attention always works for me because I was like you know what if I'm in a room and everybody has to shut up and listen to me talk about white privilege this is great so <laughs> yep. uh, so That's I amazing. think my first bit stand up bit which I still perform sometimes it's about white privilege but also how they want to be like brown people I love this, actually. I really think it's, tell us a little bit about this. I know you, not the whole bit, because we'll we'll link to it if we can, but also we'll just go see it. But tell us a little bit about this, because I think it's, it's A, so funny, but B, like you said, it's, it, it's helpful for those of us who are white. Literally, my experience, because <laughs> like, in India, because of colonialism and everything, like, and just the white supremacy, you you're always told everything white is better. Cause that's when you get the privilege, like looking like a white person that you are supposed to dress like decent and whatever civilized, you wear pants and like shirts and like you, like, you know, if you wear your ethnic wear, you're discriminated against everything white is better. And then when I moved to Netherlands, I was like, that is such a scam. They just want to be like us. Cause like I would get so many compliments on my hair and my eyebrows and oh my God, your skin color and I was like, but that woman just was racist to me because of my skin color, but you love my skin color, but like you want my skin color. You don't want this on me. And this was just like insane. Also because I'm in the sustainability sort of industry, there's a lot of appreciation for Indian craft. And then everybody wants to try out Ayurveda, yoga. Oh my God, the amount of people, women who wanted to take me to yoga class. I was like, I don't like in, I don't like yoga. Leave me alone. Like, I don't need to like yoga just because I'm Indian. It's just all these no. things that 
everybody around me was just so crazy about it. I was like, oh my God, they want to be like, we are the people that they want to be like. Like the, like the scam was exposed to me. Um, mm, yeah. And I suddenly was like, South Asians might be better. We don't even have to be better. When, like they want to be like us. So I think we should stop feeling like we're beneath them. Um, I think that's when I really was like, you know what? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna feel like I'm not enough or something just because you feel like that because clearly you don't so that's sort of yeah. like what my stand-up bit was about and I, I also do storytelling so I did storytelling and stand-up like in, in like the first month that I tried it and I loved it it was amazing you get addicted to that laughter that applause and then the people come up to you later like I talked about whitening creams and Oh yeah, tell tell us a little bit about that. So the difference between whitening creams yeah. and self tanner or tanning beds. Well, because in India, you I, I don't I didn't face this because I'm a lighter skinned Indian. That's also one of the privileges I have. Um, but if you are a bit darker, you get like told to. I also got told to not go play in the sun because you'll ruin your color. Um, you you see whitening cream ads where they really place your entire worth on your skin color. Like you could have gotten a better job. You could have married that man you could have gotten all these successes just because you know you were dark and you could have been whiter use your whitening cream um and i knew people liked to tan because i see that in india white people just sitting there in the sun like just like tanning but i didn't know how obsessed people were and i think in the netherlands it's really like a thing like i've never seen this level of want to be brown and you can say tan, but I'm, it's brown. You want to be more brown. And yep. and then I think the really, when it clicked in my head was when I saw an advertisement of Krautvat on my stories. And it was before and after of a woman. And the before was a white woman. And then the after was like brown because you fake mm. tan. In India, it's reversed. In India, before is a brown person. And then the after is just slightly like lighter skin, whiter, fairer skin. So that to me was the real, I was like, this is so insane. It's literally the opposite, Um, except for the fact that you don't get discriminated here for being white. And that's the difference. So to me, tan all you want, be whatever you want, but you can't do that while people of that color are getting discriminated against. That's what to me is just... It's, it's how do you not see that? And then the fake tanning sort of, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. <laughs> and it's a lot of money and time that people spend on yep. it. I was really, I think after two summers here, I was really like, this is such a big thing in your life. And also if my friends, we would go shopping in the winter, they would be like, oh my God, I cannot wear this. Look at my legs. They're so pale right now. I need some color. And I was like, you know, you're the beauty standard, right? You know, this is what they're using on billboards to sell things. Like the pale skin, the white, everything. Do you, you are the beauty standard. And then even, so to me, all the conclusion I came to, it's like, it's just capitalism trying to just scam us all into just buying more things. Because if God forbid not you being- like your body, God forbid you like what you look like, you will not, you'll stop buying things. Um, yeah. Yeah. You said something that I thought was really important. At least it was important. It was a, it was a moment for me when I was watching your your stuff when you were saying that um something about someone saying um you were saying whitening creams is not the same as self tanner. They're like, "Yeah, well, but you're like, but the privilege that you have with this and you can pretend not to be yeah. is this thing that I think is this aha moment that you may have, you may be easier at having because you've done it, but that it's not the same. That is the yeah, because you can take it off. You can take the self tanner off. And in my in my comedy, but I say like, do you want to go through airport security looking like me? I don't think so. Like you know, you don't you don't want to be checked all the time at the security because just because you're you look a certain way. And then yeah, so I also talk about this experience at the airport. But yeah, I don't, it's, you can, you can wear fake tan, you can tan, but also have it in mind 
what society actually or capitalism is actually trying to do because in the other part of the world people are doing the opposite um, I think just yeah. having that awareness it's not okay stop doing whatever it's just have that awareness yeah yeah and is that that's what I, my big question for you is is because um when you have these these realizations like you've done like I've done and I hope to keep doing um it does for a minute make you go, Oh my God, I, I should, I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing. But when people leave your content or evolve along with you, because I, I, I love that that's part of what you're doing is you're also evolving and learning and teaching. Um, when people leave, what do you want them? Is this the new awareness you're bringing to them? And that inherently changes the world. Is that, would you sum that up as your, what drives you or Maybe you could tell us in your own words. What is that what drives you, those those moments? I think what drives me is speaking about my own sort of realizations, experiences, and how I'm navigating all the things I'm doing. And if other people can relate to it, learn from it, get awareness about their own sort of thoughts and what they feel and what they think about, then that is just to me a great bonus and it makes me want to keep doing what I'm doing. And I say a lot of times, why am I doing what I'm doing still is because of all the messages I get. I get so many messages um, telling me this helps them. This is relatable. If they want a confidence boost, like this gave them that boost. So I think yeah. also it is just so important. If you have a voice and an audience, you need to use it for the good and I can't just not say something. So I don't, and I don't want to say something as like a preacher or like, oh, I know everything. That's why I only talk about it from my own experiences because that's never going to be not valid. It's always going to you know, stand true yeah. because I experienced this. This is my lived experience. So yeah. I always try yeah. to talk from my own experience. I don't try to be the know-it-all sort of, I know everything. Um, and I choose comedy to do it because I love making people laugh and I've I've been now especially after I've seen like heard the laughter in real time that's why I think I love stand-up yeah. comedy it's because yeah it yeah. just it, it makes you feel so good and I do it via comedy because I feel like it's an easy digestible way to give a bit of shocking information and if <laughs> you didn't learn from it at least you laughed and I think if if yeah. the world would be better if people were a bit more, you know, self-aware, lighthearted, sort of just not angry all the time. But I mean, we have to be angry for a lot of things, but at our own selves, I think if we can just think in words and just think of our privilege. And I think because I have so much privilege, I also wanted to make content where I make other people realize how much privilege they have, especially in the Netherlands, it's, yeah, there's so much privilege people have here and you can hate everything still. You can still complain about everything. The weather sucks, blah, blah, blah. But just realize how much you have that people would kill to have. And then you can, you know, go ahead and do that. But I think that's also one of my main motivators is to show people how much privilege they have and how good they have it. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so what's next for you? What should we, we be watching? I mean, I know you're, you're putting out a ton of content, you're doing stand up. Um, what is your next, what is next for you? What's the next stage or is there one? I think the next is whatever I feel like. I love that. That is also such a privilege, but, uh, I definitely want to yeah. continue doing my comedy. So if you want to come to one of my stand up shows, I yeah, where can we see you perform? I post, um, I do multiple like different venues. There, there's an amazing stand-up comedian um, community in Amsterdam and Netherlands also. It's just, and I'm so glad I'm part of that community. So I'm doing uh, stand-up here and there, but I put it usually on my Instagram profile and Perfect. stories okay. to like all of my upcoming shows. I'm not a prof like a professional like comedian. I mean, I am, but it's not like I do it all the time. I just do it when I feel like it. I also do storytelling sometimes. I also post that on my profile. Um, 
So Instagram is a great place to watch yeah. TikTok and Instagram, of course, and we'll link those yes. below. Um, yes. But so if we want to see you live, but also um, you're posting regularly on yeah. Instagram. And if and you want to join the conversation, my stories are the best place because that's where I'm really out there. Um, and yeah, I just, I think I'll just continue making content and see how it evolves with how my experiences evolve. So yeah. yeah, you'll just keep following your own flow. I love it. I love that. And I, I, uh, my hat is off to you, thank as you they say. That is so sweet. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I will continue to follow along as a fan. Um, but yeah, I just really appreciate you coming on, answering all my questions, telling your story. Um, and I look forward to learning, learning along thank with you. Thank you for having me. It was so nice to talk to you. Thanks so much.